And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want to introduce you to Leanne Pierce this morning. If you do not know who she is, you need to get to know her. I want her to share a little bit about what's coming up with the Way Center. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor. Um, so my name is Leanne Pierce. I'm the director of the Way Center in Haines City, also known as the Women and Youth Center, but we more commonly call it the Way Center. Um, we are a faith-based nonprofit organization uh, located right um, downtown in Haines City, and uh, we provide services to families in need or crisis. Our mission is to um, help families in need or crisis, help them overcome obstacles that are keep them keeping them from meeting goals. We have a multitude of programs that serve the community, our crisis care program, which is kind of a front door. If somebody's in some type of crisis, we either help them with that crisis or direct them to a resource that can. We have a couple of mentoring programs, and then we also have a transitional home, a Christian home for women and children who are either homeless or in a um, unstable environment. So um, I have a table out in the back that can give you more information. And I want to encourage you guys. One of the things we have on the table is an outreach card. Sometimes you're driving by and you see somebody that might need some help. And you can just have this in your car and kind of hand it off to them. And it would be able to tell them about the services that we provide. But the main thing I'm here for to do is to tell you guys about our annual event. It's called our um, fall fundraiser. And we're selling tickets, and we've had them on sale for a few few weeks now. This is the last Sunday you can get your tickets. So if you've been thinking about it, just want to encourage you to do that today. October 1st is our deadline. You can either come by and purchase a ticket today, or you can grab one of these flyers and, and use the QR code and purchase your ticket online. But just a fair warning, October 1st is our deadline. So if you've been thinking about it, don't hold off anymore. Let's get it done today. We do have a few seats left, and we'd love for you to come. Um, I think we are at two tables, at least maybe three. I'd love to bring a fourth table of Northridge people on. So if you guys can come, if you haven't seen me yet, please come visit today. And again, you can grab some tools off of our table um, or just grab one of these flyers and get your ticket online. So thank you guys so much. And um, thank you, Northridge, for being one of our, our mission partners. Amen. Amen. Great job. Thank you for your ministry, Leanne, and for the opportunity to share in what God is doing there at, through the Waste Center. Let me mention to you a couple more things by way of introduction today. If you did not get Lord's Supper cups today, I've asked uh, Pastor Harold if he would, and Jacob also has got uh, a basket. If you could lift your hand, if you did not get a Lord's Supper cup, and they'll be coming around, just hold them up, please, until they get to you. And uh, I would appreciate that so very much. Uh, as it relates to our ladies, this, this coming Saturday would have been your breakfast or brunch. You are not doing a brunch this week. Just re be reminded of that. You have another program Saturday night called In Aspire, right? It's going to be an exciting time for the ladies to get together, and I hope you'll do that. If you have not yet gotten your Aspire tickets... I would encourage you to go by and see Miss Debbie. will be at the table after service today, and she'll be glad to help you with those tickets. So make sure you go by and see. That would be a great time of opportunity. The men are not allowed to come. They kick us out. But sometimes we sort of peek our head in a little bit just to see. And we had a, we, we had a blast last year, and I know you'll have one again this year as well. All right? Let me mention to you also our men for breakfast. Uh, we do have our breakfast for our men this week coming up on Saturday. It's 8 o'clock. We'd love for you guys to come out and join us in a time of fellowship as well as a time of prayer. And we look forward to spending some time with our guys on Saturday morning. And one more thing before I get into the text of our scripture this morning. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, you may want to take an opportunity to begin turning there. In the pew or the seat in front of you, there is a little brochure on Amendment 4. And uh, it's a really... Uh, tough place for us to be in as a state wished we were not here but amendment four for us that you do not know what this is amendment four is a is an opportunity to change our constitution that would basically eliminate any laws of the land that may come about for abortion issues basically opening the doors wide open for abortions to happen at any point in time during a woman's pregnancy uh, their language is such that it even takes out the position of a doctor. So 
potentially somebody may, someone may be doing abortions that's not even a medical professional. And it also takes away probably the most scary part for me is anything of parent notification or parent, parent uh, approval. Uh, but bottom, bottom line is they basically say that before a lady, a, two, a 12-year-old girl could come in and have an abortion, and the only thing that they would be required to do is leave a voicemail on a phone that at least the child said is her parent's phone. It may not be her parent's phone. The reality is there's no parental involvement in, anymore if this were to go through. So I want to encourage you to take an opportunity. The bottom line is I'm just asking you as a congregation that you vote no on, on Amendment 4. If you're concerned about Amendment 3, I would also encourage you to vote no on Amendment 3 as well. There's a whole other reason for that, but uh, just vote no. We should not be doing those two things, and uh, I hope you'll take an opportunity to do that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and following, gives to us the context to this section on the blessings of Christ. We talked about last week the, con- the perspective of the past blessings we have in Christ. I'm going to pick up and read starting there if we can. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, past tense, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, past tense, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined, past tense, for us to adoption as sons through the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace in which he has blessed us in the beloved. He celebrates the fact of what Christ and the Father has done for us in the past in determining a plan for you and me for us to be part of the family of God. God determined for that to happen. And in reality, verses 7 and following gives to us an idea of what the blessings that we have, not just with the past decisions and the plans of God, but in the present aspect of what God is doing in our life, where it says in verse 7, that in him, present tense, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses or sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, both things in heaven and things on earth. A little bit of trivia, and then we're going to get into our text this morning. Where our children are with us today. And so we want to be careful that we make sure that our kids are involved in some kind of way today. And I'll be doing that in just a moment with some illustration. But by way of trivia, you know the seven deadly sins, you know, somehow or another identified through the Catholic Church. Thomas Aquinas actually sort of popularized what Pope Gregory the Great did in the 6th century to be able to sort of come up with these seven deadly sins. He, he identifies them as pride and envy. Gluttony, we never talk about that in the Baptist church. Lust, anger, greed, sloth. Yet the scripture gives to us seven sins that the Lord hates or the, is, becomes an abomination. You might want to write down in your notes somewhere in that, around that section, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. And it lists seven things that the Lord, that is detestable to God. Haughty eyes, which would resemble pride, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots evil, heart that are, feet that are quick to rush to do wrong, a false witness, people who spread falsehoods, and then a man who stirs up dissension among the brothers. So here's the question this morning as we think, relate with that. As we look at these seven deadly sins, as it were, what's the most common one that men confess to lust that somebody said lust that would be right that's 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 what that's what most of the time that's the most common one among men what about among the women (laughs) i'm not even gonna ask who said that it came from this side of the room but anyway let me restate that this morning (laughs) Either pride, if we use the seven deadly sins that the Catholic Church identifies as pride, if we use the seven sins that Proverbs actually identifies, it becomes a lying tongue or a spreading falsehood or a gossip in that regard. 
So I'll, I'll give that into the scripture reminds us that all sin, no matter what it is, there's not one greater than the other, but because all sin leads to death, right? Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is second piece of trivia. Is there a sin that cannot be forgiven? Okay. How many of y'all say yes? How many of y'all say no? How many of you say, I don't really know. That's a good spot. I, I love that. It's a great opportunity to learn. Here it is. Here's the answer today. Scripture gives to us. Here's two verses, two passages to write down. Mark chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. Mark 3, verse 22 through 30. And Matthew 12, 22 through 32. Matthew 12, 22 through 32. And what it says to us in both of those passages, it talks about the unpardonable sin or the unforgivable sin, which is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the rejection of what the Spirit is doing in your life and my life to bring us into relationship with Christ. We know that feel, that draw for those of us who know Christ. We know that sense. For me, it was at seven years of age. But for some of us, it was a different time of our life where we felt the draw to Christ and we surrendered to Christ to be our Savior. Potentially, I hope you have. If not, I hope today will be your day. And at that point in time, we became a child of God. We, we had our, our, our lives set on course for eternity. And we're going to talk more about that specifically today. But for those who choose to never respond to the Spirit's draw, it's living in rebellion against what God is seeking to do in our life to draw us in a relationship with Him. Ultimately, if we go to the place in our life, come to the end of our life, having never accepted Christ as our personal Savior, God cannot and will not force you to go to heaven if you've chosen to live all your life in separation from Him, Right? God's not going to do that to you. If we rebel against God all of our life, if we refuse to the draw of Christ in our life, ultimately we'll live a life of eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Third question, how much sin does a person have to commit in order to miss heaven? How many sins? There was a lot of people who said one. How many would say one? Okay. Scripture, here's another verse to write down. You might want to write down your notes later on to go study. James chapter 2, verse 10. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, If we've committed any sin, we're, it's as if we're guilty of all of them. I'm paraphrasing there just a bit, but that's what that verse says. And so we come to this place in our life that we find ourselves sinners all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all there. How many of y'all are here this morning? Thank you for volunteering. You've all sinned this morning. We all admit that. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We, we've fallen short of the expectations that God has in our life. We've missed the mark. And henceforth, we are sinners and in need of a Savior. This passage we have today talks to us about the blessings of redemption. I'm going to walk through them fairly quickly this morning for the sake of our children, particularly today, the first part we talk about is the celebration of the present blessing of redemption. The present blessing of redemption. That's point number one, you notes: the present blessing of redemption. This concept, this idea that God's doing something in our lives now. He's helping, he, we see in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 of what he did He's working now to work in our life, so we have an opportunity to celebrate what God is doing in our lives currently in the lifetime in which we live. And the first thing he talks about in him, verse 7, says we have, here's the word, redemption. Letter A, redemption. There was a story of a young boy who actually set out to he loved the outdoors, he loved the water, he loved, he loved the idea of sailing, and he, he set out with his father's help to build this beautiful little toy sailboat. And as he set out, this, he, he set out to build this sailboat, he got it finished, and he, went, he would go out to the Great Lake every once in a while, and he would sail that little sailboat around the edge of the lake, and one day while he was out, there was a great wind that came up through and actually blew that sailboat out, to the, out in the water beyond his ability to see. 
And the little boy went home distraught. He went back day after day after day looking to see if that sailboat possibly might have come along the shore that he could actually pick it up and take it back home. One day, one day later, he found himself walking through the town and looked inside of a shop window of the store, of a store window, and saw his sailboat that he had made in the store window. And he stepped inside the store and told the store owner, he said, Sir, he said, that's my sailboat. And the store's owner says, Oh, no, sir, that's not your sailboat. I paid a pretty penny for that boat. One of the fishermen of the area came by and sold the boat to me. And I, I, that's my boat. If you want that boat, you're welcome to buy it. And it cost X number of dollars. The little boy went out and actually worked hard, diligently, to be able to raise enough money. Did everything he possibly could to raise enough money to be able to buy that boat. Because he was so desiring to have that boat to be his once again. And finally, he raised enough money, and he was able to go in and bought the boat from the store owner. And as he was walking out the store with the little boat in his hands, he said these words. Looking at the sailboat, he said this, you are, my, you are twice mine now. Once because I made you, and now because I bought you. You see, that's what happens to you and I as a follower of Jesus Christ. You and I are his because even in our mother's womb, before our moms or dads ever had an idea that we were a boy or a girl, maybe, probably even before we even, they even knew we were, she, she was pregnant, God was at work inside of her, of her womb, Psalm 139, shaping and molding you into the perfect image that God had destined for you to be. You are made in the image of God and God was there working in the pr secret places of your mother's womb. So in reality, God ultimately made you. But we grew up, as it is for all of us, we grew up. And as we grew up, no matter how hard we may have tried in life, we grew up and found ourselves in a position where that as we grew up in life, we, we just became a, a young man or young woman. By the way, I've got pure life water. <laughs> Isn't it great? Pure life. So we got some pure life water this morning. And when these, these young children, they start out very early in life, they're absolutely perfect, right? Until they're not. <clears throat> but anyway, they're, 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 they're perfect in, in many, so many ways. But that's what happened in your, your life and my life. We found ourselves in a position in life that we sort of got to the place in life that we lived a pretty good life. But at some point in our life, we would oftentimes call it the age of accountability, and we'll not get into those that, that, that particular story, but at some point in time of our life, we chose to begin to do things that were wrong. How many of y'all have ever sinned at least one time per year? Okay, I'm 62 years of age, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to drop in 62 drops, but I'm probably going to drop in, oh, I don't know, probably 35 drops here somewhere along the line. So if this is 35 years of your life, here it is. This is cyanide, by the way. How many wants a drink? Huh? Come on, come on. It was pure life water with a little side. I mean, surely enough, that's okay, right? Scripture teaches that you and I were sinners. We're, we're, we're broken individuals. Our life has been marred by sin. And here's what we do so many times in life. We want to sort of add some good things to our life. And so we take some pure life water and we add it. And we would may dilute it a little bit more, but I mean, if I filled the entire glass up with water, were y'all ready to drink it yet? No, because a little sin destroys the whole bunch. We're sinners. And while we find ourselves sinners, Jesus Christ came to pay the price for your sin and mine, right? We're his because he made us. We're also his because he bought us. The second thing we find in this scripture, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness, here's the second word, forgiveness of sin. It's amazing when we look at the person of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was the perfect God-man, right? In all ways he lived his life, and this is Christ. He was a little taller than I am. I don't know how it was in life, but let's say he was. 
he lived his life a perfect life and he he too matter of fact the scripture says in John 14 verse 6 he says this he said I am the way the truth and the pure life I am the life and as Christ we find himself also in this particular place of life he is he's life in him we have life in him we have the redemption the forgiveness of sin so we find ourselves in this journey of life as a sinner and a savior scriptures teaches us in every way just like we he was tempted but yet without sin and so he lived his life a perfect life and he he found himself at the end of his life hanging upon a cruel cross to pay for the penalty of our sin the redemption of sin to offer to you and I forgiveness of sin here's the third word I want to talk about today is the word grace Romans chapter I mean first Corinthians um, Ephesians chapter 1 verse verse 7 says to us in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace what a what, what an amazing word it's a word we use in so many kinds of different ways it's a it's a word that we sing sometimes amazing grace remember the song oh, amazing grace y'all not gonna sing with me i'm not gonna sing okay amazing grace we we, we like to talk about grace grace defined really is this is that we receive what we don't deserve and so scripture teaches us that in the reality is God gave us an opportunity to be able to experience his grace that that is a child of God we enjoy the riches as a matter of fact scripture would even say that his grace is sufficient for all of our needs it's an overflowing abundance of unmerited love inexhaustible in God and freely accessible to everyone through Christ and so we have this promise that we have that we've been this grace of God in verse 8, which he continues to say, which he lavished upon us. He didn't just sprinkle it upon us. He didn't get a squirt gun and squirt us with. He took an entire fire hydrant and blew it on us. It's been lavished on us. And then these last th two, 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 two or three words here, in all wisdom and insight. Not only do we have this current blessing of redemption and forgiveness found in grace, but that grace has also brought to you and I spiritual discernment. That's the last, the letter D in your notes, spiritual discernment. To be able to see and understand and know, to be able to sense without even somebody telling us that God is calling us into a relationship with himself, to have that, that sense within our spirit that we need to respond to Jesus. And some, some of us, I hope all of us today in this room has, and if not, I hope before this, room, before this day ends, you will have, res have responded to Jesus Christ and his love offered to you so that your, who wants to drink some cups? Your sinful life might be paid for, forgiven, that you might experience God's grace and ultimately the discernment that comes through that. Here's what I want to do, make an application. Four statements, four little quick statements real quickly at the end. First of all, you need to know, let's personalize it just a bit. My sin debt must be paid for. I have, I am a sinful man or woman. And I, my sin debt must be paid for. I'll either choose to reject Christ and the offer of salvation Stand before God one day in judgment, be cast into a lake of fire of eternal punishment in order to pay for, quote unquote, the sins. And unlike the, the doctrine of purgatory that the Catholic Church would teach us, there is no escape from hell. Because my sin debt must be paid for. It'll take me eternity or, G, or, we'll, or we'll either choose to accept what Christ has offered to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Secondly... The cross was Christ's payment for my sin. Here's the next feeling. The cross was Christ's payment for my sin. Jesus Christ climbed up on an old rugged cross, allowed himself to be nailed there, to pay for the penalty of our sin, his, his shed blood on Calvary became the payment, the redemption price that God offered to us, that, he, that God required of us, that he would pay for the penalty of our sin. 
which would offer us number three in your notes, forgiveness. Forgiveness is offered to me through Christ Jesus. We have that offer. It's been offered to us. We can have it or we can walk around the rest of our life as a sinner who will one day face God as a sinner or we'll have an opportunity in this life to be able to, oh, we could add a few more things to our life. We could add a little bit more good deeds to our life and hope it all work out in the end. So sometimes we do. Lord, aren't you proud of me? I've, I've been a good husband. I've been a good wife. I've, 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 I've been a good father. I've been a good mother, whatever it may be. And we realize that that's not good enough. Or we'll find ourselves at some point in time in life simply accepting Christ to be our personal Savior and allowing the sin of our lives to be totally eradicated, washed away, cleaned up. And the choice is yours. And it's mine. At seven years of age, I knelt down in a little yellow chair in the kitchen of my home and I asked Christ to come into my life and to forgive me of my sins. And at seven years of age, Jesus Christ washed my sins away, both past, present, and future. At seven years of age, I was, I was secured. I was established for eternity. And one day I'll spend eternity in heaven, not because I'm a perfect individual, but because Christ is in me. And his blood became payment for my sin. And his blood ultimately washed away my sin that I stand before God as a clean vessel. Isn't that great? Isn't that a great story? We have this present experience that we have, but we also have the future blessing, verses 9 and 10 talks about in this passage, the future blessings of redemption that has everything to do with this concept of that which is yet to come. Notice how verses 9 and 10 states it one more time. He says it here, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for us. And here's this next fill in the blank. God's plan for the fullness of time. In amazing, in your life and my life, before we were ever born, before the foundations of the world ever was created, God purposed to redeem you and to save you from your sin. God loved you enough. Long before you ever sinned your first sin, God loved you. Yet knowing everything you would ever do, God chose to extend his love to you. What an amazing love that is. So that we might have relationship with him. God's plan in the fullness of time set in eternity past, ultimately lived out in the current, current time, the present tense that we're in, and ultimately set forth in the future that one of these days we're going to spend eternity with God. Not because we deserve to, but because of what Christ has done in us. Ultimately, when we come to the end, verse 10, it says to us, set forth in the Christ as a plan for the fullness of time for the purpose of uniting all things in him. That's the last fill in the blank, uniting all things in him. So let's let's make some application real quickly if I can this morning before we close. The question there really is, is God's plan for humanity will be fulfilled. Adam didn't mess up God's plans. When he sinned in the garden, it didn't mess up God's plans. All throughout history, as people rebelled against God, they didn't mess up God's plans. You and I, when we were born, didn't mess up God's plans. When we chose to rebel against God, we didn't mess up God's plans. God's plans are ultimately going to be fulfilled. He's God and we're not. You can take the big G off your shirt. You can take the little G off your shirt. You're not even a little God. It's him. He's God. You're not. We can celebrate that fact. His plans are going to be fulfilled. The question remains is, what about his plans for you? As it, re- re- as it, as it points to or begins with the fact of his plans to redeem you, you see, his He paid for the sins of the world. His death on Calvary's cross was sufficient to pay for the entire sin of all humanity. But not all of humanity will receive that plan, right? If you have received that plan, let me just ask you this question. Did you you get up this morning celebrating the fact of what Christ has done? 
when he, long before you were ever created, he thought about you. He loved you, knowing everything it was to know about you. He chose to love you. Did you celebrate the fact of what God has done for you, past tense? Of what God is presently doing in your life to making you into the image of his son. And what God will do in your life one day is setting you on a course for eternity where you'll spend eternity with him. Because all that's not your doing. It's his doing in you. So this morning with your Lord's Supper cups, I'd like to ask you if you would to draw the attention there. And as you grab those cups, I want to just lead us in prayer if we can with every head bowed and every eye closed today. I'm going to ask you a question today. Have you come to the place in your life that you know for sure that the forgiveness that God has offered has been applied to your life? Have you received Christ to be your personal Savior? If not, why not today? At seven years of age in the kitchen of my home, I'd come home from church on a Sunday night. I was, we would say under conviction today, my, my, I knew within my spirit that God was working in my heart. You know that when it happens. We can call it all different kinds of things, but I knew in my heart that God was working in my life. I knew I wasn't ready to meet God. I knew I was a sinner. Even at seven years, I'd never murdered anybody. still haven't murdered anybody, by the way. I'd never done any of those gross kinds of things in life, but the reality was I was still a sinner. And it only takes one sin to separate me from God. And I knew at seven years of age I needed a Savior. And I turned on Walt Disney when we walked, walked, got, into, got home that night from church thinking that Walt Disney would solve my problems, would soothe the, con my, the stirring of my spirit, and Walt Disney did not do it. I went inside the kitchen of my home and I opened up the ice box. That's what we called it back then. Got out a big old box in that ice box of ice cream and made a, dipped me out a big old bowl and thinking that that bowl of ice cream would fix every boy's problems. And I took one bite of that ice cream and realized that this is not going to solve my problem. That the only way the stirring in my heart would ever be satisfied was for me to give my life to Jesus. And in the kitchen of my home, I knelt down beside a little yellow chair and I said something like this, Lord Jesus, I've sinned against you and I'm sorry. I know you came to forgive me of my sins and today I accept you as my Savior, ask you to come into my life and to forgive me and promise as much as I know how for the rest of my life to serve you. What happened in that day was life-changing for me. It wasn't the words of a prayer, but it was the attitude of a heart. It was the Spirit of God stirring me and me yielding myself to the Spirit of God. And God radically changed my life that day. He made me His child. And today He can make you your, His child as well. What about you today? Do you know Christ as your Savior? And if not... Would you consider today opening your heart and letting Christ come in to allow Christ to fill your life that your life may be clean, ready to meet God? Father, in these few moments, I pray that you would stir our hearts and bring us to a place where that if there's someone here that's never met you as Savior, that today, God, that you would stir in their hearts and maybe even at this moment, they would utter a prayer similar to what I prayed that day in, at seven years of age, many years ago, when I simply said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I've failed my own expectations, much less, much less yours. And yet, Father, I know you died for me. Your son, Jesus, his, his blood was shed on Calvary's cross that we might have forgiveness. And today, I choose to accept that gift of forgiveness as my own thank you for saving me today father i pray today if some have prayed the prayer today that god you'd give them the courage and boldness to make sure they grab a neighbor or grab someone sitting closer maybe stepping by to see us at the end of the service to say pastor today i prayed to receive jesus as my savior because i'd love to celebrate that i'd love to help them to take steps just like himmler did this morning and what a celebration it is for us to see someone takes the step of, in obedience to baptism 
So God, I pray today that you'd encourage us and strengthen us and draw us to yourself. Father, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, God, that you would ready our hearts to celebrate this ordinance of the church, that we might be reminded of what you have done and what you are doing and what you will ultimately do in bringing us to a place where we'll spend eternity with you. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. The, t- the wafers found for us this morning, if you'll remove the clear part or sort of clear part of your cup, there's a un- piece of unleavened wafer on the top. It's a representation of the body of Christ. The Bible t- says to us that we know how much he loved us in that he gave his only begotten son to die upon a Calvary's cross. He might be able to give his life as a ransom for many. The Bible says that that he was beaten so badly that he was unrecognizable and he gave his life for you and me because he loved us. He loved us. He loved you. He loved me. Today as we partake of the bread, we're reminded of his gift of of his son's body for us. And we thank God for the gift that we have today in Jesus Christ and the body that he gave for us. Father, we ask your blessings upon this wafer. May it be used to draw our attention to the very fact of all that you gave for us, that we might be drawn to a place where our hearts and our lives might fully serve you, that we might love you with all of our hearts, minds, and souls. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you eat with me, please? Scripture says to us on the night that they had the the first Lord's Supper that after Jesus had taken the unleavened bread and passed it and they broke off it says he passed the cup it was a cup of the fruit of the vine grape juice as it were in that day the grape juice is a symbol of what Jesus would be doing the the very next day as he was nailed to a cross Romans chapter Hebrews chapter 9 says that without the shedding of blood, there is no payment for sin. Jesus Christ, his blood was shed for us to pay for us, to redeem us, to make the payment that would be satisfactory for Christ, for God the Father to accept you and I and ultimately offer to us forgiveness. So the blood of Jesus Christ is that gift to us. And so as we partake of this juice, may we be reminded that of the shed blood of Jesus Christ for my sin and for ours today. Can we do that together? Father, we thank you again for the juice that you've given us and the opportunity to be reminded of the price that you paid that we might have forgiveness of sins. May it not only be a reminder of celebration, of gratitude, but may it be a motivation for us in the future to live holy lives before you. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. May we drink together. Tradition tells us that after they had the first Lord's Supper that they sang a worship, they worshiped 